And uh, if you are all ready, I will call this case. It's People versus, and correct me if I mispronounce, Micheline and Jeremiah Lefeu. Um, good morning, and you may proceed. Good morning, Your Honors, and may it please the court. Catherine Marcus from the State Appellate Defender Office on behalf of Micheline Lefeu. Um, Mr. Kershaw and I will be splitting our time equally, and I will try to reserve one minute for rebuttal. The Attorney General agrees that the common law affirmative defense of defense of others was available to Ms. Lefeu, that Ms. Lefeu made the evidentiary showing necessary to have the jury instructed on her affirmative defense, and that counsel's failure to request that the jury be instructed on the applicable law with respect to defense of others was a, quote, oversight. Given these concessions, I will address the point on which we disagree, um, which is whether the failure to ensure that the jury was properly instructed prejudiced Ms. Lefeu. The prosecutor argues that the error was harmless because there was a way that the jury could have acquitted Ms. Lefeu under the instructions they were given. And they argue that the jury's decision not to do that indicates that they didn't believe that she entered the home to come to her mother-in-law's aid. But that argument assumes far too much. The jury here was never told that defense of others was a complete defense to the crime of home invasion third degree. They were not instructed on the law applicable to that defense. And the instructions that they were given left them uninformed on how to perform their duty. In this case, where defense of others was Ms. Lefeu's sole defense and substantial evidence supported that defense, the error undermines confidence in the outcome. And there is a reasonable probability that a properly instructed jury would have reached a different result. And we ask that this court reverse Mr. and Ms. Lefeu's convictions and remand for a new trial. Um, I'm happy to take the court's questions. Thank you, Ms. Marcus. Um, I will start with Justice Clement. Uh, no questions right now, thank you. Justice Kavanaugh. I have no questions. Justice Welch. None at this time. Um, Justice Zara. Not this time, thank you. Justice Viviano. No questions. Justice Bernstein. I don't have any questions at this point. Uh, Ms. Marcus, you wanna continue on or let Mr. Kershaw take some of the time? You guys decide. I will um, yield to Mr. Kershaw, but I would like to still reserve some time for rebuttal. Absolutely, Mr. Kershaw. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court, Joel Kershaw on behalf of Jeremiah Lefeu. Um, and as uh, Ms. Marcus pointed out, uh, there was a, a pretty substantial concession in this case by the Attorney General. Um, as far as Jeremiah is concerned, that concession being that uh, Jeremiah was entitled to a defense of others instruction as to the charge of home invasion. However, the Attorney General uh, does argue that he was not entitled to that instruction as to the charge of felonious assault. And uh, respectfully, and obviously I, I disagree with uh, uh, with that position. Um, in this case, the presumption by the uh, Attorney General seems to be that uh, because there was evidence presented by which a jury could have found that it was not self-defense, that he was not entitled to, to that instruction. However, the evidence in this case uh, did establish that, uh, that, that did establish enough evidence by which a jury could very easily have determined that this was a defense of others case. And uh, even in regards to the uh, the felonious assault. So even though the, uh, the the attorney general likes to use the language of he was uh, that Jeremiah was attempting to kill the complainant in this case, um, that is a conclusion that, that the attorney general makes. That is not something that is that is demanded by the evidence. So I did want to go through that, but I do want to focus more of my attention onto the issue of uh, since we do agree that as to the more serious charge that uh, Mr. Lefeu was entitled to, a, to, entitled to the instruction and had presented enough evidence to support the instruction, I do wanna focus on the prejudice argument, which is really the main point, main bone of contention that we have. Um, and I would, I would just, uh, in, in making that argument, I would point the court to the to language that uh, appeared in uh, Strickland versus Washington, which is, as we all know is, the seminal case from the US Supreme Court in terms of sorting these issues out. And what they say in that, what the United States Supreme Court said in that case is that the assessment of prejudice should proceed on the assumption that the decision maker is reasonably 
conscientiously and impartially applying the standards that govern the decision. It should depend, it should not depend on the in, 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 uh, idiosyncrasies of the particular decision maker, such as unusual propensities towards harshness or leniency, although these factors may actually have entered into council selection of strategies and to that limited extent may thus affect the performance of inquiry, they are irrelevant to the prejudice inquiry. Thus, evidence about the actual process of decision, if not part of the record of the proceeding under review, and evidence about, for example, a particular judge's sentencing practices should not be considered in the prejudice determination. Um, the reason that I, I took that uh, portion out of Strickland is because of the fact that this jury was given specific instructions. For example, one of those instructions is the judge said, it's my duty to instruct you on the law. You must take the law as I give it to you. If a lawyer says something different about the law, you should follow what I say. And finally, what, what we have here going, or what I, would have, what I would point out is that assuming that the jury followed these instructions, it is almost inescapable without that defense of others instruction that they would that the jury would have come to a guilty verdict, which I think makes a very strong showing of prejudice because defense counsel essentially conceded every single element of both crimes that Jeremiah was uh, was charged with. The government's position here essentially asked the court to assume that the jury disregarded the instructions that it was given um, and went and decided that because there was arguments made about defense of others, therefore we might that the jury must have known about it. I don't think that that's supported. So, um, Mr. Mitchell, let me see if anyone has any questions for you. Okay, sure. um, Justice Clement. Uh, no questions. Thank you, Justice Kavanaugh. No questions. Justice Welch. No questions. Justice Zara. Um, thank you. As I understand it, your client is relying on a defense of others theory, not a self-defense theory. So his use of the knife needed to be necessary to protect Siebert or Michaeline. And my understanding of the record indicates that when uh, your client brandished the knife, Michaeline had already been, was already passed out and Porter was not threatening any harm to her or to Mike, uh, I'm sorry, or to Siebert. So how was the brandishing of the knife necessary at that point to protect the women? Mm -hmm. Um, well, first of all, we have uh, Michaeline, who is unconscious on the floor. I think that a part of making a determination of whether the defense of others is reasonable is looking at the totality of the circumstances as is reasonable to look at them at the time. Um, uh, Jeremiah enters the house, sees Michaeline on the floor having been knocked out, doesn't have time to instantly completely evaluate how much threat there is. He's simply looking at, I need to get Michaeline out of the house in order to make sure that she gets the medical attention that she needs. I don't know what Mr. Porter is going to do. I don't know if he's going to stop me from removing her from the house. Um, but one way that I can make darn sure that she, he doesn't remove me from, or doesn't prevent me from, from protecting my wife um, is by using a show of force that is proportional to the show of force that was already shown to uh, Mrs. LeFew. I, I think given the exigency of the circumstance, I think that is a proportionate response, especially in light of the need to remove Michaeline from the situation in order to um, ensure that she gets whatever medical attention that she needs. And I think that does present an ongoing threat to Michaeline's safety. Thank you. Justice Viviano. No questions. Thank you, Council. Justice Bernstein. Council, thank you. I have no questions at this time. You may continue or um, reserve that time for rebuttal. Um, at this point, although I have plenty more that I, I'd like to say, um, I do want to give Ms. Marcus a chance to speak some more if she'd like to. In whatever time she doesn't use, I would uh, reserve for the two of us to share for rebuttal. Okay. Ms. Marcus, you're muted. Do you have more to say right now? I don't. I will reserve my time for rebuttal. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Bengartlin. Thank you, Your Honor. So may it please the court, Assistant Solicitor General Linus Banghart Lynn, on behalf of the people and the Aranac County Prosecutor, respectfully requesting that this court uh, deny the applications because they don't present a jurisprudentially significant question that's worthy of this court's attention. Uh, the significant question in this case would be whether defense of others would be available uh, for non-assaultive crimes, including home invasion. The parties all agree on that. Uh, the Court of Appeals didn't hold to the contrary, though it expressed some skepticism. 
but I agree with, um, I believe it's Michael and LeFew's supplemental brief that says that Dupree and Triplet removed any doubt on this score, right? We know that this is available for non-assaultive crimes. Uh, the decision below is unpublished, so it's not likely to be cited to mislead the bench and bar. Uh, the invited amici have chosen not to weigh in, which I think signals that there's really nothing significant here. The only remaining questions before this court are questions where the answers are inextricably tied to the specific facts of this case. And so any decision that this court renders is not going to advance or develop or clarify the law. It's not going to be useful to the bench and bar. It's only going to sort of clarify the, the, the relations of the parties. Uh, and so for that reason, I think leave should be denied on these applications. If this court chooses to grant leave, um, then this, the court should affirm because there's no reasonable probability that the jury that unanimously found beyond a reasonable doubt that Michael Ian LeFew did what she did knowing it was wrong and without justification and excuse could also have found with a different instruction that uh, Michael Ian or Jeremiah or both acted uh, as they did uh, with, a, with an honest and reasonable belief that they had to prevent the unlawful application of force against another. And so for that reason, there's no reasonable probability on these facts um, that the instruction would have made any difference. We know how the jury felt uh, about the defendant's conduct on the instructions that Michael Ian LeFew was given. Um, at that point, I'd be willing to stop and take any of the court's questions before I say more. Thank you, counsel. I'll start with Justice Clement. No questions, thank you. Justice Kavanaugh. No questions. Justice Welch. Um, yes, I do have a quick one. Uh, thank you so much um, for your arguments today. Um, one of the things I'm wondering, um, I think that was briefed, was uh, this notion that Michael Lean's, um, you know, there was this notion of uh, just cause or excuse uh, in her jury instructions. And um, that Jeremiah's jury sort of could have considered that um, in um, making their own determination or the determination as to him, I should say, the jury. It, wouldn't this violate well-established principles that jurors follow instructions? And are you essentially arguing that uh, the jury just could have nullified? And doesn't that go against normally how we instruct juries to behave? Um, no, I don't think it goes against it because our argument is not that the jury would have acquitted, that the jury might have believed Jeremiah, but that it, it would have acquitted on these instructions because it understood sort of the, because it would have ignored the instructions. Uh, that's not our argument. Our argument is that there's no reasonable probability that the jury did believe Jeremiah, right? And so because we know how the jury felt about Michaeline and because there was really no gap in their defenses, um, that they, they rose and fell together. And so there's no reasonable probability uh, that the jury felt that way. Now, if, the, if there were a reasonable probability that the jury believed Jeremiah, then I think we would have at, at least tough sledding, if not maybe even having to concede the point. Because yes, if the jury had felt that way, they might have convicted on these instructions. I don't think it's very likely, but Strickland only requires a reasonable probability. So, you, you know, that, that would be a tough argument for us. But because we have more information, right, this isn't a case where it's pure speculation, as the defendants, at least one of the defendants said in the brief, we have information that this court can use as evidence in, in reaching its decision. And, and so, so it's, I don't think that we're trying to counter the presumption that juries follow their instructions. Okay, thank you. Thank Justice you. Zara. Thanks. Following up on the a question I asked opposing counsel, um, uh, the defense of others instruction allows for consideration of how the excitement of the moment may affect the choice defendant made. Would not the sight of his wife unconscious and on the floor make Jeremiah's decision to brandish a knife reasonable under those circumstances? It would only impact it. it I mean, it, it can't just be a reasonable feeling that you need to do what you're doing. It has to be a reasonable uh, an honest belief that you need to prevent the unlawful use of, of force against imminent unlawful use of force against another. So even though in seeing force used against your wife, you might be sort of inspired in hot blood to then brandish a knife at somebody, that's not self-defense and it's not defense of others, even, even accounting for sort of the heightened significance of the moment. It might 
you know, if it had resulted in a killing, it might reduce first degree to second degree murder or something like that. Um, but as far as it, it, it can't just, it's not just the state of mind of the defendant in terms of how he feels about his conduct, but whether it is aimed at, whether it's reasonably um, aimed at preventing the unlawful use of imminent force uh, or imminent use of unlawful force um, against another, which as, as your question sort of recognized, had already happened to Michael Ian, and so could not have excused um, Jeremiah's brandishing of the knife. Thank you. This is Viviano. Yeah, thank you. Uh, counsel, I guess I have two questions. One is, you indicated that there's nothing jurisprudentially significant about this case, and essentially what I heard you saying is it would be along the lines of error correction, but the Court of Appeals in this unpublished opinion at least express some confusion on whether or uh, whether the defense of others um, instruction would be appropriate in these circumstances and I, I think they refer to it as a novel would be a novel application of the law so wouldn't if we were to rule in the defendant's favor wouldn't that have the uh, a, a clarifying effect on the law I mean it would it would just it would just be one more sort of decision from this court I think that I mean hopefully future courts and future attorneys are going to look at Dupree and are going to look at Triplett and be guided by those decisions. And they're not going to need to sort of add Lafeu to, to, to the cases. So I, I mean, yes, it would, it would have an effect. Um, and, and it is unfortunate that the Court of Appeals did think it was novel. I, I, I disagree respectfully with their, with their belief that it was novel. Um, but ultimately, they didn't even reach a holding on whether the defense was available or not. Um, All right. fair, fair enough on, on that point. Let's advance to the issue that really is before us, which is this prejudice question. And I just have a specific question. When we're looking at the charge against, is it Micheline? Micheline? I don't know how to pronounce her name, but the, that, that, that uh, she destroyed or damaged property knowing that it was wrong or without just cause, et cetera. And I think the argument is which was adopted by the Court of Appeals and that you're advancing is that the jury's finding that it was without cause is akin to a finding that it would not have been justified under a defense of others theory. But the, I guess the, the question I have is, aren't we expecting the jury to know a lot about the law? I mean, isn't it when the judge goes on, as my colleague suggested and gives the, the instruction I mean, isn't that meaningful to the jury that where the judge explains the law and explains the, not just the concept of just cause kind of in the abstract, but how that legal concept could apply to the particular facts of this case, it's sort of an elaborate instruction, right? The, the defense of others instruction. Um, why should we think that the jury figured out all the different kinds of just cause that the law might recognize. How would they even be in a position to know that? Well, I think the, the first part of my answer is that I think the, the, the more important part, I mean, the, the, the instruction was that she had to know that it was wrong and without just cause or excuse. And I, I think that the knowing it was wrong part is perhaps even more significant than the just cause part, because I, I think that there's, I think there is an argument that just cause can mean different things. Uh, but the jury actually had to find beyond reasonable doubt that she knew what she was doing was wrong. And I think when you have the case presented as it was presented by all three attorneys, um, it was very clear that, uh, that the jury was expected uh, to acquit Michaeline if, if she didn't know what she was doing was wrong. And the only argument that she didn't know was wrong is that she was there to rescue her mother-in-law. Um, and so it, this isn't a comp, in fact, I mean, the instruction she gave was arguably broader than the instruction uh, or the instruction she was given, uh, her jury was given was arguably broader than the defense of others instruction because uh, it, it doesn't require that it actually be reasonable, right? It, if, if you unreasonably think what you're doing is right, then you didn't know what you were doing was wrong. And so the jury- I have a lot of, I have a lot of confidence in jury and their, the common sense that they bring and their ability to decide factual questions, but I just think your position is puts a, a lot of stock in there and sort of intuitive, the, the intuitive ability of the jury 
and knowing the difference between right and wrong to have an understanding of a, a more complicated legal defense. Sort of the whole reason we give an instruction is because this defense may not be so intuitive and then and there's specific parameters and that we want the jury to be aware of in applying the defense. Are you, are you suggesting that they sort of intuitively know about self-defense and then defense of others and making a determination of whether, you know, right from wrong? Um, well, again, the jury doesn't need to know right from wrong. They need to know, they, they need to decide under the instruction that they were given whether Michael Lee and LeFew knew that what she was doing was wrong. So it was really about her state of mind and everything. And I think the fact that it was not a nuanced and complicated instruction, it was a very broad and general, and, and I, I, yet I would say even intuitive instruction. If Michael Lee and LeFew knew what she was doing was wrong, didn't know that what she was doing was wrong, then she had to be acquitted. And I think the jury absolutely intuited, I mean, from the arguments of all three counsel, that the question before them was, was she there reasonably to, well, not even reasonably, was she there honestly to rescue her mother-in-law? And if she was, then she didn't know what she was doing was wrong and she should have been acquitted. And that's the only way that a jury that's following its instructions could have um, convicted her is if it rejected, if it found beyond a reasonable doubt that she did not know or that she did know that what she was doing was wrong. And so, and so the, the, the jury's conviction on that point shows that they found that beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, we don't need to know what the jury thought was right or wrong, right? We know we just know what the jury thought about Michaeline's state of mind as she did what she did. I'm a little confused on that last point. I mean, wouldn't the jury have to, to know or think that it was wrong for her to do that before they can sort of reach the conclusion that she thought it was wrong, knowing that it was wrong? I mean, they have to make a sort of a decision the first sort of decision that it was wrong. I mean, otherwise we're convicting somebody for their mistaken belief that they did something that was wrong. I guess you're right. I guess the jury had sort of two opportunities to acquit on that instruction. If the jury thought that it wasn't wrong, then it could acquit on that basis because she couldn't have known that it was wrong if it wasn't wrong. And if the jury thought it was wrong, but she didn't know it, then it could acquit on that basis. Um, so I guess in that sense, the instruction is even more favorable to Michaeline than, than I had sort of described it. But either way, whether the jury, if the jury had either believed that what she did was right, or that she thought that what she did was right, on either finding, the jury could not have convicted if it was following its instructions, which means it had to find both, as you point out, that it was wrong, and, uh, and that, that, that the Michael Lane knew it was wrong. It had, to, it had to make both those findings beyond a reasonable doubt. All right. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. Justice Bernstein. I don't have any questions at this time. Thank you. I have a couple to follow up on Justice Viviano's questions, um, counsel. I, I, I guess, um, wouldn't, wouldn't it help the jury to understand that the law, in fact, gives her just cause and makes it not wrong if, in fact, um, she can satisfy the elements of the defense of others' defense? So wh how could it not make a difference for them to understand that there is a way in which what you're doing is not wrong. And in fact, there is just cause for it. I think that would actually be a more limited instruction. I think that would be a less favorable instruction. I think the instruction she got was broader uh, and, you, and, you, and didn't require the elements to be satisfied. And I understand the burden is on the prosecution, but in, as far as what, as far as the ways in which the prosecution could satisfy its burden, I think the instruction, it gives it more. I mean, the belief has to be reasonable to, to take a, so, sort of, I think the main example and sort of what you need to believe and it has to be the imminent use of force and it has to be unlawful force, et cetera. Um, whereas the instruction that the jury got sort of did away with all of that and, um, and basically said, if she, again, I'm kind of repeating myself, but if she knew, didn't know it was wrong, then she would be acquitted. That was the instruction the jury received. You have to find beyond a reasonable doubt that she did what she did knowing it was wrong. And so the jury, and the jury clearly understood, I think, I think it's clear from the way the case again was presented that everyone agreed that if she was there to rescue her mother-in-law, uh, that that was the issue. I mean, the prosecutor kept saying, it, it, it's important, you, your job is to decide who's telling the truth in this case. On, on the defendant's arguments today, 
the prosecutor could have said, it doesn't matter who you believe in this case. And I, I mean, I've seen prosecutors' arguments that say that, right? It doesn't matter what you believe because the, the, the testimony in this case is all to sort of irrelevant defenses that aren't before you, right? Everyone agrees the defendant did what he did and on that finding, you, you have to convict. That's not what the prosecutor did here. The prosecutor didn't say, well, you're not being given instruction on defense of others. And so you only have to decide whether they actually came in and, and attacked uh, Mr. Porter. It, instead, the prosecutor said, it's very important that you determine who's telling the truth in this case. The reason that's important is because if Michaeline and Jeremiah were telling the truth in the case, that would impact the verdict, it would require an acquittal. So I think they, to, the, to answer your question, I think the instruction they got was broader and more, that Michaeline's jury got, or that the jury got with respect to Michaeline was broader and more favorable than the, than the more detailed uh, and nuanced defense orders instruction. I appreciate that answer. Thank you so much. And I, I want to say, I also appreciate your um, concession on the substantive legal question. It's helpful for us to be able to focus on what's what's left. Um, turning to your Lizzie, response to Justice... Oh. oh, you're still going? That's good. I just oh. had one more question, but you can jump in. Go ahead. Go ahead, Justice. No, when, you're, when you're done. When you're done. No, no, because if, 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 it's fine. Go ahead. My, my question is, I guess it does follow right on this point, is the, the only the one defendant is, of course, charged with home invasion with this misdemeanor predicate offense of malicious destruction of a building under $200. Isn't it pretty attenuated to say that the other defendant who's charged with much more serious crimes, I mean, it's still home invasion, but with a different predicate offense that doesn't have this element, who engaged in different conduct leading to those charges or allegedly engaged in con you know, different conduct. The prejudice analysis should still be that if the jury didn't believe her or convicted one defendant, then, then they just wouldn't have believed anything that anybody, that either of them said. That seems kind of a big stretch to me. Am I wrong? Um. I would. I, I don't think it's that attenuated, and I and I don't agree. I don't think it's a stretch at all. Even though their conduct was different and the charges were different, uh, the defense was the same, and their testimony was in accord with each other on the relevant points. And so I think if they had separate juries, again, this would be very difficult. Um, but again, it's the same jury. I mean, but the jury, so could think... the jury could have convicted one and not the other. I mean, that's theoretically possible, right? Yes, I mean, inconsistent verdicts, even irrationally inconsistent verdicts are permitted. Juries can do what they do. I think we have to presume that the jury, I mean, again, as the defendants have said, and I, I haven't argued to the contrary, we but the yeah, presumption. But let, me just, let, me just, let me just jump in there. There would be no inconsistency. They're charged with doing different things at different times. The jury could easily find that one person did what they were charged with, but the other person didn't, right? That wouldn't be an inconsistent verdict. That would be the jury I, doing their, their general. This was a, a sequence of events that happened over a period of time, right? I, I don't, it might not be an inconsistent verdict as in, in terms of the legal term of art, but I don't think that there's any rational view of the evidence that would allow the same jury to find, if, if the question were whether they did it or not, right? That would be different facts. We have no question that both of them did the actions they were accused of. It's, it's only based on the defense. And I don't think there's any rational view of the evidence that says, Michaeline LeFew was not there to rescue her mother-in-law. She was there because she just wanted to attack Michael Porter. But Jeremiah LeFew was there to rescue his mother. I think that the, the defendants didn't present any different defense in that regard. And the, the attorneys didn't argue any differently in that regard. And I don't think there's a, it, is it a conceivable? But Strickland doesn't require a conceivable uh, a showing of prejudice. It requires a reasonable probability. So I would disagree that there's a reasonable probability that the same jury could have convicted Michaeline and, and acquitted Jeremiah on these facts. All right, thank you, Counsel. Uh, Chief Justice, I apologize for interrupting. No, not a problem at all. I, I wanted to turn to your response to Justice Zara's question about um, the defense of others charge with respect to the felony, the felonious assault charge. And, and um, it, it, it felt to me like you all were talking about whether the instruction would have succeeded in Mr. LeFew being acquitted. Um, but I just want to, so I want to back up for a second. Would you concede that at least the rational view of the evidence would have um, justified giving the instruction had counsel known to ask for it? Do you agree with that? No, our primary argument is that is that there's no rational view of the evidence that he used non-deadly force 
uh, against Mr. Porter. I think his testimony was he picked up the knife and held it at his side with the point towards the floor, which is to say that he didn't even commit felonious assault. Um, uh, and I think the other view of the evidence is that he in fact slashed at Mr. Porter, damaged his watch and cut his wrist. Um, now a knife is a deadly weapon. And also he made statements uh, that he uh, wanted to kill Mr. Porter. Um, I think I, I think I wasn't I wasn't very clear in my question. I I, I just meant oh. to be asking if um, the you know given that the facts are that he comes in and his wife is um, unconscious on the floor bleeding out and having a seizure, wouldn't a rational view of the evidence support his asking his counsel asking for a defense of others instruction? Um, to defend against his felonious assault charge. Isn't it rational if your wife is bleeding out on the floor to grab a weapon? Because she might well be in even more danger. Um, no, because I think you would have to have a reasonable belief that she would be in more danger, that Mr. Porter was continuing to attack her um, or that he was, I think Mr. Kershaw's answer to the question, and, and he can respond, of course, if I'm, if I'm mistaken in, in, in my view of it is that, you know, maybe he needed to fend off Mr. Porter as he got her medical attention, but I don't think he got her medical attention. So, um, so I don't think, I think you still have to be acting to sort of prevent the imminent use of unlawful force. And I don't think the testimony supported that. Now, again, could defense counsel have asked for it? Sure. And, and, and maybe the court would have given it, but I, I don't think, I don't think it was, I don't think it was supported by these facts. I appreciate that. Okay. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, Ms. Marcus, you guys have, you all have 10 minutes and 53 seconds to work with. Thank you. Um, first to, to opposing counsel's point that the instruction, um, given to the jury, um, for Michaeline was sufficient The the without just cause or excuse language from the third element of the malicious destruction of property misdemeanor. Um, underlying the home invasion third charge, just to sort of ground where where this language is. I would agree that um, that it's very broad, that third element. Um, I don't think that that broad here is good. I don't think that broad um, really gave the jury um, any information on how they were to figure out what kind of conduct was justified. Um, a specific defense of others instruction would have told the jury to consider how the circumstances appeared to Mike Lane at the time. They would have instructed the jury to consider the excitement of the moment. And very importantly in this case, um, it would have instructed the jury that if Mike Lane's beliefs were honest and reasonable, her actions were justified even if she was mistaken. And I think that is, that is an incredibly important instruction in this case where, um, the fact it wasn't really this two on two credibility contest. Um, Lisa Siebert, Michaeline's mother in law, testified yes, he, he didn't actually let me leave the home and he did knock me to the ground. Um, but I, you know, I, I don't think it was intentional. Um, she, she supported the fact that Michaeline and Jeremiah, um, you know, the, the, uh, what they described to be seeing from outside of the house. She had a different take on what it all meant and what kind of danger she was in. Um, but um, she, her testimony was actually consistent with Mike Lane and Jeremiah's on that point that when they came to the door, she was ready to leave and was um, stopped from leaving and, and then was knocked to the ground and taken to another room. Um, so that specific instruction would, would have been very important for the jury to hear. Furthermore, um, the, the knowing um, what, that what she did was wrong language um, is really irrelevant to a self-defense or defense of others' um, defense. The jury is not asked to determine whether she knew she was violating the law or if she knew that kicking the door was, was against the law. Um, they're asked to determine whether she honestly and reasonably believed she needed to do that um, to come to the aid of her mother-in-law. Um, so, so whether she knew it was wrong um, it is really irrelevant. They need to determine her honest and reasonable belief and the necessity. Um, and then just quickly about the, the, the other point about the um, jurisprudential significance of the case. I would point out that the um, Attorney General's Office took a, a different stance 
on the underlying law in the Court of Appeals and argued that um, Mike Lean and Jeremiah were not entitled to this instruction. And the Court of Appeals opinion, though it doesn't um, you know, completely resolve uh, that issue, um, they certainly suggest that the defense is not available. Um, Dupree was cited to the court and the court cites Dupree in the opinion, um, but they don't uh, recognize that Dupree and Triplett control the situation and also almost suggest that um, the Self-Defense Act has modified the common law, or at least that that is not clear. Um, so I, I think that there is good reason um, to, to issue in an opinion or, or order in this case, making clear um, that the common law affirmative defense of defense of others is available to an individual charged with home invasion if supported by sufficient evidence um, and to grant Ms. Lefeu a new trial because trial counsel was ineffective in failing to ensure that the jury was properly instructed on the affirmative defense. Um, and I will, unless there are questions, yield the rest of the rebuttal time to Mr. Kershaw. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Marcus. Are there additional questions for Ms. Marcus? Okay, Mr. Kershaw. You're muted, Mr. Kershaw. Thank you. Um, and jumping off where uh, Ms. Marcus left, left off, um, certainly I do believe that uh, there is value in this court considering this case, um, because as Ms. Marcus pointed out, and I think as, as Justice Viviano pointed out, there is considerable confusion uh, in the lower courts about whether or not the defense of others defense is applicable to the crime of home invasion. Um, as uh, Ms. Marcus pointed out, um, the Court of Appeals seemed to think that that Dupree was limited in its scope only to because of the fact that it dealt with conduct that occurred before the Self-Defense Act uh, was ratified. It didn't, it, it had no bearing on the law after the enactment of the Self-Defense Act, which um, which at this point, even, uh, even the Attorney General's office has conceded that it still does have bearing post-Self-Defense uh, uh, post Act. So I, I think there is certainly plenty of confusion here um, in the lower courts. And if the Court of Appeals can be this confused about the applicability of the defense, the Attorney General's office itself can be this confused about the applicability of the defense. Um, certainly, trial courts around this state are going to be confused about the applicability of this defense unless this court offers uh, a clear direction on that. So, um, and for that, you know, for that reason alone, not, not even getting to the other issues, I think this, I, I think that this court really should uh, grant this application and provide clarification as to the applicability of that defense, because there obviously is a lot of confusion as this case points out. Um, I would also uh, I would also point out, just shifting gears a little bit, um, there was a lot of talk about the instruction that was given as to Michaeline about the, um, you know, whether or not she believed that what she was doing was wrong and all that, uh, and, and that, uh, and, and whether or not it was justified. I would point out that, and I think this court is, from the questions that were asked, is already well aware of this, but I just want to point out, Jeremiah didn't get the benefit of that instruction. And I think one plausible interpretation of the jury's verdict, even if the jury were to say, okay, Michaeline, you know, Michaeline uh, didn't really believe this, but we don't even have to ask that question as to Jeremiah because that, that wasn't even part of the jury instructions. So the fact that he wasn't given that jury instruction, I think even strengthens Jeremiah's case um, that uh, the jury was just misinformed about, uh, about the applicability of the law. Um, moreover, had the jury had the jury been instructed about the applicability of defense of others, it would have known not only that Jeremiah had to um, that that if that if, Jer that if Jeremiah reasonably believed uh, that his intervention was necessary, it doesn't matter whether he was wrong. And the evidence, both looking at the preliminary exam transcript, the contradictions in Ms. Siebert's testimony between the preliminary exam and the trial, and her own concessions at trial, I think. A, had a jury known that mistake as to the facts, even you know, and, and taking into account the heat of the moment, also taking into account that if the burdens on the prosecutor to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that, that Jeremiah was not acting in defense of others, I think all of those would have been helpful to the jury in making a determination. We can't simply assume that because the lawyers in this case 
seemed to kind of sort of take it for granted that this was a defense of others case, that the jury just completely ignored the instructions the judge gave them, especially when the judge said, if, if, you, if the jury lawyers give you contrary instructions, follow mine, not theirs. Um, we can't just assume that the jury disregarded that instruction and, and knew what the law was in terms of defense of others and made a decision based on a law that they didn't understand, that they couldn't have possibly understood unless they researched it themselves before going into court, were not instructed on it. Um, and I think taking all of that into consideration, looking at the, um, at the legal presumption about how a jury operates, I, I don't, I frankly don't see how, how the government can maintain in this case that the jury, that there is not a, at least a reasonable probability that the jury would have come to a different verdict had it been properly informed. Um, I, I, I think this case is, is almost a textbook example of a case where there's at least a reasonable probability. And we don't have to show a certainty. We don't have to show beyond a reasonable doubt. We, don't, we just have to show there's a reasonable probability that the jury would have come to a different decision. I don't think that, uh, that anything that's been stated today undermines that. And um, for those reasons, I'm, gonna, I, I'm asking the court to grant this application and ultimately to reverse the Court of Appeals on this because frankly, the, the opinion of the Court of Appeals um, is wrong on, on many fronts. And, and even though it is an unpublished case, it, is, it still remains persuasive authority. And as we all know that persuasive authority um, is relied upon pretty substantially by the trial court. So if th these errors are not corrected, I, I think that this court of appeals opinion has the potential to do some, some serious damage in future cases as well. So for all those reasons, I'm asking the court to grant the application and reverse the court of appeals. Thank you all um, uh, for your presentations. The case will be submitted. That will end the morning's case call. Uh, we were scheduled to start the afternoon call at 1230, but since we are a bit late um, uh, finishing this morning, we'll start at 1240. So we'll give everybody uh, 10 more minutes to try and grab some lunch and see everybody in uh, 25 minutes.